Recording is now working. Um, we before we started the recording, we noted that um, the agenda was posted, asked for bashing, and there was not any. So we are going to start in on the agenda as was posted on the list. The first two items there were the errata that were posted. The um, first errata. was a RADA 64.99, and it was about whether or not the signed, it was how the signed identity digest was supposed to be encoded. I believe that we have reached a um, consensus on the list that the encoding was, and I don't have the notes in front of me, but the, the, the URL base 64, I think was the it's right in the document it says uh, b64 and specifies the base 64 character set in the grammar and it should be url safe b64 and should specify the url safe b64 character set in the grammar so the characters are wrong but the uh, but the incorrect encoding is actually mentioned throughout the document it's not the only uh, grammar but it's mentioned in the like, section for one like in other places, but it can be fixed by just going through the document and looking for everywhere where base 64 is mentioned. Hmm. So the erotic does not do this work, right? It needs to mention other locations where the encoding is actually specified in the document. It's not, it's specified in more than one place. Um, so the, the errata only fixes the A, B, and F. We need to fix the text as well. That's correct. Yes. Uh, I signed a note about this uh, at one place, but I agree that there is probably other place where we should uh, say this. All right. So I believe our path forward is that we edit the errata to adjust those other places in the text and mark it as accepted. Is there anybody that thinks that's not the right path? I was just going to say, I mean, I, I again, I, I don't know how deep we need to go in in the text itself to post the BNF. There, there may be a couple of the places, but just skimming through it now, I mean, places that are like non-normatively referring to that it's base 64 encoded, I think it's okay. Um, but like, yeah, we, we let's do that work. Let's go through and like check them all and figure out which ones actually need to be changed. Right. I mean, ultimately it points to 75 or 19, which authoritatively says what a JWT base 64 URL encoding needs to take place. So, but, uh, but I'm, 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 I'm okay with uh, going through, but who, who is the errata author? What process wise should happen here? Is the errata author responsible for that or authors of the document responsible for that? So, um, I'm willing to take whoever would like to volunteer to propose what the errata should be changed to. At this point, I believe the chairs or ADs are the only people that can go in and change this admitted errata text in the errata system, but that shouldn't dictate who does the work. I mean, again, there's there's like three other instances where it's mentioned, like in the document, as far as I, I can see, just on a quick find. And like, I'm not super worried about any of them, to be honest. But I mean, if is this a discussion like Roman, since you kind of raised this point, I mean, do you feel that those other references are material? Like, like uh, I just added? don't want to kind of leave any point of confusion because, again, this is. Like but this, doc but uh, this document is like essentially people refer to it, and it's very hard to deal with implementers who say that this uh, this is mentioned somewhere else. And yeah, so I mean, I just... when I read a piece of non-normative text of the form, after these two JSON objects, the header and payload have been constructed in Base64 encoded, they must be hashed and signed per RFC 8225 section six. Like, I don't believe that needs to be fixed to say Base64 URL encoded. For it to like do its job. And okay. uh, I'm fine with that. I I'm mostly concerned about the grammar. That's the yes. like the main place because people implement things based on the grammar and things are failing because of that. But 
the other ones are because if it's it mentions uh, uh, the correct standard, so that is probably fine. So that leaves us with accepting the errata is currently posted and moving on. That would be my just looking at these now. That would be my inclination. Yes, I would agree with that. Also, okay, I'm fine with that as long as we fix the grammar. We're good. Mm -hmm. All right, then that's our action for that. So let's move on to our double quote question. So we explicitly discussed several things in this thread um, as the as our core documents were being put together. So the conversations around whether or not we're going to change the grammar to allow comma separated values or things that that we actually reach consensus on. And I don't believe that we're going to try to open this up at, at this point. We did have um, a discussion at IETF 101. I went back and listened to the recording. Um, there was not a lot of depth in that discussion. It was basically a, hey, let's make a decision. Let's require that we put double quotes around things. Are everybody, is everybody okay with that? And the answer was yes. Um, we've got some feedback that there are implementations out there that are, are mixing it. Um, probably because of implementation through example or, or just mistakes. And the question now is, is it, do we, um, you know, what, what level of adjustment do we make? As best I can tell, the conversation on the list is trending towards requiring the quotes in the grammar and adding a note that notes that early implementations sometimes don't provide them and implementers should consider being lenient with what they accept. Um, again, my suggestion, and again, I'm a little bit biased, is just uh, make, uh, instead of uh, quotes, no quotes, just make it this uh, match the generic param, saying that it, it will take either to a token in the grammar or the quote a string. And essentially, like leave it at that because th that way, all the implementation, like all the implementation, should be working with each other. But that you know, the downside of that that all the implementations potentially will need to change to support uh, accepting either quoted or non-quoted values. But they would be able to send whatever they prefer. Yeah, Chris, I, I I don't agree with that because first of all, uh, I don't think that's how we generally think. We don't say you know do whatever generic param. I mean, it, this is one instance where it, where we explicitly uh, define the the syntax. So it should uh, I think it should be either with quotes or or without quotes. <laughs> But if we're doing quotes, then the next question is: Do we have quotes around the token, or is it a quoted string? That's an excellent question. Yeah, that, that, that's sure. a good question, but, but but I mean, on a high level, I think we should have either we should have quotes or no quotes. Then, of course, we just, if we have, if we go for quotes, we we can decide on that. But from yeah, so, uh, so that if if I get in on this, I mean, I think it would be okay for me at least to do generic param, provided that we also say we're asking, you know, you should send quotes, right, and like do the. So, I mean, what we don't want to do is create, a, I agree, a BNF that invalidates if quotes aren't present. That, that I think, is the issue, right? Because if we do that and there are implementations that are, for whatever reason, sending without quotes, then, like, they, they would not be compliant. If we're telling people to be, you know, lenient in what they receive, Postel principle-wise, then it makes sense to have the BNF allow for that, but we should still have the statement in the document that you must send quotes. <laughs> well, is it the must or it should? I mean, it should be a must, I think, yeah. Like, because the, the other kind of uh, big question is why do we want quotes around this value? It is a token. Like, it's never, it, it, like, the those quotes are totally and completely redundant, and they also kind of imply that the value is case sensitive. I get, I get it, but this is look. This is where we ended up. Most implementations, I'd say, are doing it this way, and so um, I'm not. Like going from, to... Yeah, I would like, not agree with most, but 
I would not agree with most. Like, for instance, New Star does it, uh, it with quotes, like for the hosted service, TransNexus does it without. And, like, you can... <laughs> It's it's split like from what I'm seeing and for, uh, for like I looked for the interrupt it kind of split evenly. Yeah, so my proposal would be even simpler. Is it? It is to do not touch the Please grammar. Speak up a little, it's very difficult to hear you. Sorry. Yes. Bring the microphone closer. So my proposal would be to do not touch the grammar at all. To leave it as it is, which is without code. And then to add a sentence somewhere that said, uh, receiving implementation should ignore if there is a cut outside. So we don't, don't change the meaning, which still says that we should send a token without cut. But if there is cut outside, just rem remove them and treat it as a, as a token. And it should work fine. That's probably that's closer that's to the meaning of what we're trying to say than just allowing always sending quarters. But the reason this all started is because we have other specifications that have quotes in them. We have added specifications that have quotes in them. We have implementations that have quotes in them. And but like, none of them are normative. Like no, I don't. Is like the the big thing is like there is no normative text that says that quotes should be there. They're all in examples. So if we say that uh, uh, like the grammar is normative and, quote, and coding by example is wrong, then this should not be uh, a normative decision. As I pointed out on the list, there is one normative statement that does say that the value is quoted. Now, I agree, it does not say you must quote it, but it said there's a must in that statement and it refers to the quoted value. And so like that would have to be changed, period, right? I'm not convinced that's true. I'm hoping I'm currently reading the right email. But from what I can see, it says that the JSON value has to be the quoted value of the parameter on the identity header, which would mean that I read that as you put quotes around the value in the identity header and stick it in the JSON field, which is an odd way of explaining it. But Yeah, that, I, mean, I understand the reading is slightly ambiguous. I think it un unfortunately it can be read to be suggesting the quoted value in the identity field, it, the, the value in the identity field is quoted. I think a lot of people read it that way. And this is what got us into this situation, right? <laughs> yeah. Like the whole I mean, section the is the about... Fact that the, the fact that most of the examples and add aspects all have quoted values tends to, to, for me, to say that most people accept that it should be quoted. And I, I don't have exact statistics, but I believe the vast majority of... Uh, identity adders out there do have quoted values. I could probably get those statistics if we really feel like we need those, but uh, my general experience is that most folks are quoting it. Again, from like uh, the little interrupt that we did, is, as I said, like for instance, if we are dealing with uh, an API service for generating identity headers, if you're looking at Newstar, they put quotes, TransNexus doesn't. You look at open sips, put quotes, Camellia doesn't. And it kind of keeps going that way throughout. <laughs> I, again, I'm not sure, like, statistics wise on the uh, deployed endpoints, but, like, from implementation standpoint, I'm seeing both quite evenly. Alec from Chance Nexus, just one point. Uh, yes, we don't put quotes, uh, but we do accept both quoted and unquoted. And, you know, we're happy to change the authentication to create quotes if, if needed. Um, yeah. So don't, we, we, we don't need any backwards compatibility, but on the receiving side, we accept both and we don't plan to change that regardless okay. of what the outcome of this is. Yeah, but that, that's kind of my point. Like the, if I'm looking at two authentication services and one does it and one doesn't, and, the ex, and from what I'm seeing, uh, implementation generally accept both. So no, no one here has put on the table that implementation shouldn't accept both. I think that's one point we all agree on, right? <laughs> like every, we, they should accept both. The question is really just what is the least intrusive, least problematic fix we can make to this so that there's no more confusion. <laughs> and, you know, I think Mark may have been barking up the right tree on this um, in the sense of, I mean, the, the least intrusive and most compatible fix is just to say that implementation should treat this as identical. 
But I still don't think that take that gets us off the hook of having to say, here's what you're supposed to do, right? Like, I, I still think we, we are under some obligation to give guidance on whether it's supposed to be quoted or unquoted, even if you're supposed to, what, on what you're supposed to send. Um, I think I agree with that, but I'll just kind of point out that like it really doesn't matter which one we pick because like it, it just makes no difference. I agree entirely, and this was exactly the discussion at ITF 101, which is why that discussion, as Robert said, was so kind of, you know, high level because it, because it doesn't matter. I agree. <laughs> and so, like, you know, we basically we flipped a coin and we're like, OK, we'll do quote it. And like, if we want to keep flipping coins until we get different results, we can do that. But like, I, I don't think that's a good use of our time. Let's just do quoted. I mean, there's less, we wouldn't have to change any documents other than 8224, right? And just accept, uh, just put the optional quotes around the token to update the errata? Or... Yeah, the errata would have to change the grammar to allow quotes to be present or not. Yeah. Something more like what Mark was suggesting, right? Um, and, and, you know, then, then we just, have the guidance saying yes, do quoted, but like you know, change the grammar so that it accommodates either. And specify any... some specify somewhere that both should be accepted, basically, so that's clear. Uh, I liked Robert's suggestion that we sort of say early implementations you know, for accommodating early implementations or some text like that. All right, so does this require us to do anything more than we've already done? I, I guess the errata as written doesn't say quite that, so the answer is probably yes. Would somebody like to volunteer to write the exact errata we want? <laughs> Looking at you, Mark. <laughs> Mark, would you be willing to take that on? I can. It was Roman uh, errata, but I can. Yes, I can write something. And just send, you know, send to the list um, a, a proposal for what, how it ought to be changed, and we'll see that. Um, uh, I think Murray has to do the actual edit. Oh yeah, we can't. All right. I don't think so. I think that's the yeah. case. Well, then we'll 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 pass the recommendation to Murray. All right. I will send uh, something before the end of the week. Thank you. I really appreciate it. All right. We are twenty minutes in. Um, I think we have closed both of those errata question errata questions. Um, The next thing that we had on our agenda was to um, go through um, the uh, stir identity header errors handling document that we deferred discussion from IETF 110 on. Chris, are you um, are you ready to talk about that document? Yes. Where you no, I'm sorry, this, this is Chris. I, I apologize. Uh, I was thrown out on a meeting for, for some reason. Was there an outcome of, of, of this quote thing? So the what we're going to do in it, Mark is going to work on um, an update to the errata as it's currently posted to make sure that the grammar allows both forms and to um, require quotes on sending and note that there are existing implementations that don't. Okay, and what about, so, so then if we're gonna uh, allow both quote and unquote, I guess the value is going to be token even with quotes, right? Yes. All good? Yeah, I, I can leave it that. It's, I mean, if that's the... All right. The... There will be text sent to the list that we can, 
I'm sure, in this Leeward Smith, if we want to. Yeah. <laughs> All right, Chris, are you ready to take the floor and talk about the errors handling draft? Yeah, can you? Uh, uh, one, one point of order. Could people go to the Code EMD and do virtual blue sheets, please? Yeah, Is the link to the are... Code EMD posted somewhere? We are recording this, and so far, everyone that has joined has had a uh, reasonable identification in the. Uh, WebEx roster, but I guess there's a chance that we lose the WebEx ro roster on the recording. So, um, yes, please help make sure that the, the code EMD is correct. Would somebody cover getting me into that? And if it hasn't already been posted to the WebEx chat, yeah, it looks like Russ posted the code EMD link to the WebEx chat. Chris, you started to ask something. You're muted, Chris. Sorry. Um, is it possible for you to screen share? I'm noticing my um, Mac, this Mac that I'm using doesn't have the system preference for Screen share. Uh, I might have things set up that way. Do uh, I could quick leave and rejoin too. So is it um, the slides that were at the one ten meeting that you'd like to go through? Yeah, nothing's yeah. changed. So I will uh, jump over right quick and see if I can share or not. If not, I can quick restart my thing and I should be good. I will know in just a second. Okay. WebEx. Attempt to share. We got it just before Meet Echo was available for interims, right? Yes. <laughs> so, um, yep, I can see it. Let me see if it survives going into slideshow mode. Is it still okay? Yep. All right. Yeah. Okay. So, yeah, this is, um, I forget if this is the first time talking about it. It's, I think, the first time formally talking about this. Um, this draft uh, essentially defines two uh, new error techniques, uh, two new additions to error handling. Um, one is directly adapted from some of the ADIS specs um, that I thought would be useful to define over in I IETF side and then the other one uh, is is something new so first one is essentially the mechanism that um the way we have it in 8220 uh, sorry 8224 uh is that um for the 400 acres that uh will that that is essentially killing the call um, so we wanted to allow for not having to kill the call, even if you have an error with, uh, um, verifying the, the, um, the identity header. So we define the mechanism that you should send, um, the, um, reason header, um, with the error code. Uh, in provisional responses or final responses back to the authentication service, just to let them know um, 
but in general, in the shaken world, we didn't want to, and we still don't uh, necessarily want to kill calls because of uh, the verification status would uh, may have failed. Any questions about that? I think it's a fairly straightforward concept and maybe people are already even already aware of it. Okay, I'll go to the next slide. The next one, um, this was uh, sort of thought about uh, in the world of having uh, multiple identity headers. So this was sort of a proposal to solve the case where you might have some identity headers that pass verification and some that may not pass verification. Uh, and if you send the reason code back, uh, how do you identify which ones have errors and which ones don't have errors? And sort of thought through, you know, like, is there some way we can identify it? Um, we just thought the easiest and best way to do this was to um, actually send the passport itself as the identifier um, of, of the error. Um, and that could be useful for um, operators of authentication services to quickly identify which passport has issues and, and things like that. Um, so, so yeah, uh, this is a, uh, good proposal. Any questions for that one? Um, yes, um, was, there, um, um, it seems that it's, it's a bit redundant to have the whole passport. Why do not have only the signature? Uh, where do you mean in the passport? For in the content type or what? Yes, in the content type, having only the signature would be enough to uh, to match it with the original passport, right? Um, I thought that was part of uh, the MIME, multi-part MIME requirement, but I may be wrong. Right. If it's not required, then uh, I can I can look into that if nobody knows off the top of their head. But uh, I thought that was required. I don't, I don't remember if it's required, but I, I don't think it hurts. Um, I mean, is there like a is it just do you want to save the the octats mark or? Well, if it's not useful to have it, then why carrying that? Right. I mean. I mean, you might for, I mean, it's unlikely for this use case, but of course it's always possible. There could be other mind bodies for some reason right, that are of different types, but. All right. So that, that would be my question. Would someone has a use case to carry all the stuff back? Yeah, I thought the idea with multi-part mime was, you know, the, 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 the parent level multi-part mixed content type says, you know, that the MIME is going to be multi-part and, and each part with the boundary um, then identifies the content itself. Um, I thought that was the idea. So I... that's, that's correct. Plus you will probably like, is that uh, being carried in 200 K response? Because if it's 200 K, it will also have a uh, application SDP as one of right. the parts. Right. Yeah. There's a good example. Was the question intended to say why is the whole passport being sent back, not just the signature of the passport, not so much about the content type, but the contents itself? Yes. That, yeah. that, that was my question. And we can always just specify a compact form of the passport if we care to save bytes. Just put the two dots and the signature. Right. Yes. Yeah, all right. Yeah. So that that would be my, my simplification in that case. Yeah, I I I think I thought about that. Um I think the only thing was is it useful to have the entire passport so that you can inspect it and correlate it back to a call more easily. Uh although I guess you're getting it in the context of a call. So so maybe that's not too necessary. I'm also thinking about like div and stuff. <laughs> right. 
Um, yeah, the other question is you can also just send the info, like of, of what are the chances of having two different identities with uh, the same info URL? Reckon that's quite high. Okay. Yeah, you, you mean the um, X5U URL? Yes. URL? Mm -hmm. Yeah. That would be very high because it's uh, especially going back to the same service provider. The URL is probably um, used across multiple calls for sure. Well, m multiple identities within the same call. Is that the case? Uh, the same URL to a certificate that's used across signing. Uh, call that's what you mean by the info url right yes the i'm just saying like would it the same uh ident uh, the same certificate be used to sign multiple identities within the same call like well yeah most uh or at least uh i would say a large percentage are using they're not using a certificate per um telephone number at least for shaken uh, that that's not the case for some of the other like delegate certificate and other techniques, but uh, okay. um, so that's quite common actually. Um, I, I, I'll I'll think I think the Jeff providing the signature might be a, a good one to think about. Um, well, maybe just providing. I think it's where that doesn't work are cases where you know whoever ends up being the recipient of this. 200 or whatever, you know, wasn't actually a party to the generation of one or more of those passports, which is, you know, what, what might happen in a div case or something like that. Um, hmm. Well, yes, but are you supposed to act on a negative response from a signature that you did not add yourself? It, it would it, it could potentially at least give you an insight into where else in the network for forensic purposes things were dysfunctional. Now what it, I can see both sides of that coin. It could be you know the, yeah. there's some kind of privacy revelation or something people are concerned about from that. But like that that would be the case. It would be something where a passport was subsequently added. You know this this could be like a delegate cert originally signed it and then a second passport was added for shaken purposes afterwards like there, there there's a bunch of things like that that um, uh, robert we're seeing uh, a different pdf there i'm pretty sure this is not relevant for booster well I don't know. yeah i just wanted to make sure he understood that uh All right. I mean, yeah, I, I I could probably live with just compact forum style SIGs if that if people want to save the bits. Well, that's what I was just thinking. Like, how how relevant is that uh, um, in these cases? Um, and can and that that would be my concern. Are we missing an opportunity to have the other information there? So let me verify that you're seeing what you're expecting to see again. Yes. 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 We're back. Again, it's kind of two sides of it because there is also a uh, privacy issue. Yeah, that's unbalance. I could see doing compact for that reason. Um, you know, I mean, if we want to get fancy, we could also put rules right about what you're supposed to do when you're generating this object as the the sender. Um, that like for div, for example, you on, only send compact form. There's a, there's a bunch of things like that we could do if we felt like it. Yeah, we, we can have a flag that the, the originator said, if there is a problem, I would like my full passport back. Um, even if we are, even if we do just use compact form, I am slightly worried that it'd be really easy to accidentally leak security things back upstream. I, like I can't immediately think of an example of how that would actually be a problem, but the fact that you're giving information about like who you trust back upstream does feel a bit leaky. 
Yeah, I know. I, I immediately laid it on that. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> I, I mean, I think the here, risk here. for compact forum is is pretty low. We'd need to do an analysis, but like, I'd be interested in what what the you know actual risk of that is. I want to make sure I'm on the same page. So when we say upstream, um, beyond yeah. the authentication yeah. service or because you're sending the passport from the authentication service to the termination side, or is this just a diversion case that we're talking? This is information flowing back from the verification service to the authentication service, right? Yeah, that's that's what we're considering now. So we're considering a case like, for example, where you know three div passports have been added, right? And like one of them fails. And so you get back, here's the thing that failed. And like, but you know, you're revealing potentially if you put the full form passport in something about the service logic that led to that diversion. And like it could but be did this, but, but didn't that passport go the other way through the same entities anyways? So you're not providing any new information. New information. Not necessarily, right? It's it's going forward through them. The point is in this case, unless they're stripped on the way back, right? Like they they will show up to say the originating enterprise and it will see all this service logic that got added. Yeah, that's what I was saying, like beyond the backwards beyond the authentication service, I guess, might be the concern that we're talking well, about here. Well, so if if let's say just talking about service providers, service provider A creates a shaken passport, sends the call to service provider B, who creates a div passport, who sends it to C. Service provider A never had the div passport, yeah. I never saw it. So if service provider C sends back a response, you know, 200, whatever response code with both passports, if service provider B leaves that in and sends the 200 to A, then service provider A now sees the div passport. You know, one option would be for service provider B to remove the failed yeah. passports that it generated or any passports that it generated from the response before sending it back to A. And then you never have information going to somebody who didn't have it originally. Yeah. Stripping is apply to enterprises. Stripping is an <laughs> option. You know, compact form is an option. That there and you know, compact form with flags or you know, flags saying this is privacy sensitive is an option. There, there's probably a broader analysis we do with those. Yeah. Yeah. I will say that even if you do have compact form for everything and you strip on the way back, there is still like some amount of leakage of like just a simple like A to B like service provider A now knows whether B trusts them, which they kind of wouldn't have known beforehand. These these have been raised around some of these 600 level error codes as well, these precise concerns have, right? Um, when you're rejecting calls or expressing what the treatment is you're giving them. So, I mean, I, I think that this is recognized as a trade-off. <laughs> um, I mean, operationally, is it useful to be able? I guess this, this is maybe a point. And just the A to B case, like if B feels like sharing this information in the backwards direction because it's helpful to A, like I think having a mechanism like this is worth doing. That's kind of how I felt about the 600 error codes as well. Um, so, I mean, I, I think having something like this helps in that case. I think I agree. I, I, I just would like to see a reasonable amount of analysis or like advice as to like how much information you're actually leaking and like what kind of stuff you might accidentally give yeah. if you're not thinking too hard. I, I I do agree with adding some something about the framework where the authentication service um, that re that sent that passport should terminate the reason and or strip the i guess we'd want to just remove the the reason header right and the multi-part mine body that would be the the stripping would be essentially right oh, the you would need to strip the portion which is yours because it might yes. be yes. right so it, in the reason header might still stay right. uh so what happens if you have different failures for different uh, signatures? Is it going to be multiple reason headers or? Um, I forget if I get specifically into that, but I did know that was uh, something that we do need to solve in this document. Um, 
because the other option is to just have a reason header for each failure with a signature in it. You just put the signature, the compact form signature in the reason header itself, you mean? Yes, and have a reason header for each failure. And then strip reason headers as you wind back the stack. Exactly. Not bad. How would we do it in the text part of the reason header? Or? The parameter that contains the just the compact form sig. Oh, define a new parameter. Yep. Yeah. Okay. It's not. It's not crazy. I think it work. Is that something I'd have to do in uh, zip core? I mean, or we can we start it here, but yeah, probably zip core would need to be aware of it at least. Okay. We could consider that. Yeah. That plus some guidance, as Jack was suggesting, I think would get us a, a pretty long way in terms of covering privacy for service logic when it matters and still having the flexibility to be able to do this. I, I think it's, it is actually quite valuable to be able to do this, especially for success cases where, you know, you just want to be able to express in the backwards direction. Sorry, this didn't work to the people that generated it. And here's why. Um, and just for the reference, reason header has generic params and does not have a YANA registry for them. So you can you can technically add parameters to the reason header as you need them. Without formally defining it, you mean? Yes, I don't see a registry for register params, and I just see that it has a generic param for extensions. Okay. All right, when, I'll not to derail this, uh, but you know, one interesting maybe thought might be: Does it make sense to put it in the reason header and not use a, a custom header? I know we right now use like an X authentication or verification failure reason because we sometimes you want to have the reason be for other purposes. And it makes it more clear that you know this is the shaken reason that the call may have been accepted, but some other reason for some other failure, you know, analytics or you know whatever thing, you know, using but the reason you, header kind of overloads it a little bit. Yeah. But yes. But do you use reason header for this in the two hundred or in the success responses? Um, we we don't you know we're not really operating a switch, so kind of that's up to a service provider. We but we in the VS with a SIP interface, respond back with a custom um, yeah. X header for verification response that is frequently proxy back, but you can't, you could, so I can't really answer that because we don't really specifically do anything, but we provide an X header that is frequently used. Okay. Okay. I, I'm just looking at uh, current uh, examples, like the old example, uh, <clears throat> only examples that uh, for the reason header are typically used with uh, error responses or the by messages, like the final responses, uh, something uh, for dialog termination. So I'm not sure there is much intersection with uh, 200 AG, but it probably would make it cleaner if it would be a set new header. So I don't disagree with you. Um. But then that would mean switching to that in general. And I think the guidance we already have is to use reason header with with a single passport. Um, I think we'd want to make that consistent. That would be confusing. Is there a problem with using reason header? I... Um, just the question if it's going to be overloaded with other reason header in the success response, but I'm not sure. Uh, there are other reason headers in the success response. Mm, I see what you're saying. Well, I mean, so that, that, that can be the discussion. I mean, I, I think it's probably worth writing it up and let's, let's figure out if we, we are aware of any conflicts, that's a good place to go to SIP core, right? And ask if people are aware of any implementation conflict with using reason in, in a success or provisional, because I mean, I can imagine this going with one of you three or whatever, right? Um, like, or provisional response. Yeah, I think that's good. 
But uh, maybe the bigger question here is, uh, are people interested in this? And, um, you know, I'd, I'd be interested in asking if we can adopt this document. Well, so I'm definitely hearing interest and in people making suggestions. Um, I'm hearing that there is a, a problem that there are several people here that are willing to work on. If there's somebody that thinks that the general direction of the discussion is going the wrong way, please speak up now. So I also heard that the um, direction that people were suggesting is um, probably different enough from what's in this document that it, um, adopting this particular document as a starting point may not be the right thing to do and you might want to make that call on the next revision that incorporates some of this discussion okay that's fair i'll do that so chris just poke us with a reminder after you post the next one to do a call for adoption sounds good all right thank you Okay, so I'm going to attempt to stop sharing. Has that done the right thing? Yes. Yes. All right, my apologies for the errant application behavior. Um, I will review the recording. Um, I may have to ask the secretariat to redact some of the other things that popped up before the recording is posted. And again, my apologies. So, I believe that we are now to discussing any remaining working group last call issues on the draft ITF Stern Hans RC 8226 and then um, draft ITF STIR Passport RCD. So, starting with uh, um, RSC 8226, Russ, do you want to give a summary of where you think we are? Yes. Uh, okay. So, I think <clears throat> Ben raised a question about uh, matches um, within the values um, for the must include or must exclude. Um, and so, to address those, um, I think that most of the actual use cases use simple values, um, strings or numbers, and we can uh, deal with uh, some simple text about that, like numbers. Um, you need to compare the numbers, not the uh, string that carries the number, so that leading zeros and stuff like that are not an issue. Um, regarding more complex structures um, where you could have things in different orders. I don't think uh, we have many of those cases, but we can put some warning text in here about how to deal with them. Um, basically, uh, you know, if you have something where red, green, blue can appear in any order, if you really want to exclude it, you'll have to put all the permutations. Yuck, hope we don't ever actually have to do that. Um, that's the uh, kind of thing that, that we have to deal with. And then there's white space that comes about as well. Uh, red, comma, green, comma, blue. Uh, you know, is there white space after the comma? So the suggestion would be we say when, when that occurs, you know, compress white space. Um, so, so that's my suggestion for dealing with it. I don't think, uh, well, RCD, which we're going to talk about next, is the thing that's actually using this. And so um, I believe that what I've just suggested deals with the cases that RCD has. Go ahead. Ben, ben, you, ben you look like you're, you're raising a finger, <laughs> but you're muted. You're muted. I thought Robert already had raised a finger, so. <laughs> I'm willing to go after you. Okay, so. I have trying to up level this a little bit. 
I was kind of thinking about what are the use cases for exclude value. Um, I'm not sure I see one for RCD. And the reason for that is, is there's so many ways a bad actor could evade and exclude value, given that a lot of RCD is aimed for human consumption. And so you run into confusable string problem. You run into all the uh, string identifier problems with confusable strings and things like that. That are ways that you can just trivially sneak past the verifier that's trying to verify and exclude values. Uh, things. So I wonder. To, to me, exclude values makes a lot more sense if you have a claim whose values are a strict enumeration. Mm -hmm. You know, maybe RPH or something like that, where you have known. Value, you know, people can't just make up. Uh, so the example I had, I was sharing with Robert earlier is, uh, so I'm a bad actor and I want people to answer my call. So I'm going to stick POTUS, president of the US, POTUS in my display name. I can't remember the claim offhand. Uh, and, oh, so you put in a must ex or exclude value for POTUS. Well, now I just put in space POTUS or P space O2US, something like that. The end user still see that they still answer the call. So what I was going to propose is, if we believe, yeah. first question is, is there really a use case for exclude values? And if there is, then I think maybe just some guidance and security considerations that this is of limited applicability, except for things where you have a constrained set of values in the first place. I, th I think the, the security consideration makes a lot of sense. Um, yeah. So, this is where I want to interject a question as an individual, given the discussion that has gone by, um, do we really have enough motivation for a use of this now that we recognize that there are potentially severe issues with using it, that it makes sense to, to even define it at all? Would would it be a reasonable path forward to to just take excluded values out of the um, set of things that we're defining? You know that, but I just remember that's how we got here. We couldn't think of excluded claims or excluded values, so we didn't define it. Uh, we only did the included, well, and then bam. Uh, here no, we no, I, I do think we need excluded claims. Yeah, yeah I got that. Uh, but, but excluded values, I think, is is enough of a landmine that we might want to consider just not providing it. So you're you're making the foot gun argument. <laughs> I mean, that, the point is, I, I would put it a little differently. For most of the cases where there are a constrained set of things you want to exclude, what you actually want is included values, right? Absolutely. Like, like I want to say, your included values for level of attestation is B and C, and don't include A, right? And so. Right. Like both must include and must exclude have you know effectively the same properties for those values, except must include is an additive permission that is very clear about what you're assigning, and the the other one is not. Chris and I were just talking about this yesterday morning, actually. Yeah, yeah, I I agree with the conclusion there that um, um, excluded claim is definitely needed. Um, but value, there is a lot of loopholes. I agree with Ben on that point, but there may be some. So I, I, I could go either way, really, on what, whether we keep it or not keep it. But I think you would have to put some pretty explicit security concerns about, you know, trying to around things or, or eliminating it to ex explicit values. I mean, I think this way, does anybody know of a use case for any of those constrained fields where, you know, permitted values doesn't allow us to do what we want to do? Like, that, that, that's the litmus test, and I'm, I'm not aware of one anyway. So I was uh, trying to think about a, I was trying to think about this just earlier today and thought, well, maybe there's some case where we have this set of permitted values, except you're not allowed to use one of the permitted values. And then I convinced myself, no, that's dumb. Uh, you, you wouldn't ever do that. So I agree with you. And you know, unless there was some case where the, where the, the only thing I can think of is if the enumeration is really, really big, but still constrained, you might not want to put the whole enumeration in just to save space. But that's otherwise, I think this is a uh, attractive hazard feature. Yeah, it's also not a very forward compatible 
approach to it is the other thing that, you know, because if you are then defining new values, for example, you need to exclude those explicitly. I'd rather, I'd rather, you know, then force people to change the certs to introduce new things to exclude, like in an, on, on an emergency basis, you know, the day after a new value is approved for this, do it the other yeah, yeah. way. You know, yeah. force you to change the certificate to add these things with two permitted values at such a time as you're comfortable allowing people to assert them. That forward compatibility argument, I think, is actually the strongest one for doing it. Yeah. Permitted that, that does fail safely, that's for sure. Okay, okay. so I will um, remove the uh, excluded values and uh, repost. Just a question, I mean, is that that same issue kind of happens with claims, doesn't it, on the exclude? So, you know, does, is it really critical to have excluded claims because same problem? I think there's use cases for excluded claims because yeah. claims need to be defined. We shouldn't just be making them up. And for example, one might want to say, stop putting RPH claims in your, in your passport or something like that. Or this user is not allowed, or this, yes. this, uh, certificate belongs to an entity that is not allowed to include this. I don't disagree with that. I guess what I'm saying is, you know, right now, RPH, that's a good example. But what happens if we come up with a new claim in the future? In the future. And you, you know, if you, if you excluded RPH, but you also wanted to exclude this new claim, you're kind of in the same position. So is it not better to say, if this user is not allowed to do any claim, including all future claims, here's the ones they're allowed to do so that it fails closed. They can't do that new claim. Otherwise you have to redefine the certs when a new claim is defined. And search yeah. could last for years. It it did come it, up yeah. in conversation whether or not um, we should have like a may include and an S where may include would mean you know you could include um, one of a set, but uh, not outside of that set of claims. Um, so if we if we're if we're going to be changing the document uh, significantly, we may want to uh, consider that one too. The permitted claims. Yeah. So, yeah. yeah. Something like that. Well, permitted claims already does what you just said. Right. Um, it it says these are permitted, right? <laughs> and. Uh, so I, it doesn't say okay, yeah, they yeah, must yeah. all right. be present. You're right. You're right. You're right. <laughs> okay. I, I, okay. Get, I guess the case we have is for base passports where no claims are permitted, right? We're, we want uh, somebody to sign base passports to prove they are authorized to use the calling TN and that's it. They're not authorized to do RCD or RPH or anything else. So you'd almost need to do that by defining a permitted claim as permitted, you know, as empty. Yeah. As opposed like to exclude, because if you do exclude and then a new claim is defined, you, you know, they've now got additional permissions versus if you do a permitted of nothing. That's what I'm saying. You know, not that excluding cl claims is not important, but isn't the better way to exclude claims to list the allowed claims? Well, even base passports have a claim, right? That's true. Yeah. It, yeah, so they're kind of assumed to always be there, I guess. Yeah, but the, the three base claims are always allowed, no matter what's in this extension. Mm -hmm. so that, that's, that's my that's argument my for argument. maybe we shouldn't even have excluded claims. You should accomplish you should that by allowing all other claims or all the claims you want to for future for forward compatibility. And we aren't really in an environment now where people um, arbitrarily add claims. I mean, I yeah. would kind of assume you you could, <laughs> like, you know, um, if you felt like it, it just it's a jot, right? Um, I don't mean arbitrarily. I mean a new standard is defined. A new oh, claim is defined. It's just all the certs that haven't expired yet. Would, would are those would they always be allowed to use that claim if they oh, weren't yeah, in the this? I mean, I I was making the more you know. Our, how, how do we feel in general about if somebody wants to add proprietary claims, for example, to a passport that aren't intended to be standard? Like, do we feel that that's something people should never be allowed to do? 
I was going to make an innovation argument too. Do we need to go back and change all our certificates every time we come up with something new? No, I think we do allow you to put um, whatever you want in terms of claims. And the idea is that, you know, if you don't understand those, you just ignore them. But uh, there's, I think we're talking about the critical ones like RPH, for example, or other ones that sort of um, provide you some authority that you don't have. Um, but, but, but I mean, if we introduce something that was like, you know, these are the only claims that are allowed to be in the passport, right? And like that, that's the way we frame this. We would be running afoul of Ben's innovation argument precisely. So like uh, the yeah. criticality of certain things that we're adding, I agree that with Alec, this is an issue. If we did define something that had the same impact as RPH or potentially RCD, like you would need to be able to put those constraints into service post facto. But I feel like those things are uncommon, um, or at least uh, I don't imagine we're going to be doing a lot more of those, but uh, I could be wrong. So I, I think it's definitely a good point to think about. Can we solve the base passport um, null set and still have exclude? And, and that sort of gives us the space that works there. So one I thing to point have out. to read it. I was just going to ask, can you do a empty permitted list? I hadn't read that thoroughly. Is that allowed? You just leave it out. Well, you're saying they're not allowed to do anything with them. With so what you've got now is is a bucket that says must include. That means any signer that uses this certificate must include those claims in the passport you can then say permitted values which says if you include this claim then it must have the value of that's provided one of the values that is provided and then uh we're we're talking about the, th the third bucket is must exclude which means the listed ones cannot appear in the passport. And then the fourth bucket that we just removed was excluded values. So I, so I guess what I'm proposing is, yeah, you need remove must exclude as well yeah, as the you know, excluded values. And then you would add may include. So it's not values, it's claims. I see. You can't include. So instead of a, a, a blacklist of claims, it's a white it's a list. list so, yeah. Okay. Exactly. We don't use those terms in the ITF anymore, apparently. But uh, <laughs> all right. <laughs> but, allowed. but allowed to be present, but not required. Exactly. And there are yeah. claims, not values. I got it. So I uh, brought up the issue on excluded value because I thought it was hard to use it in a useful way. I I don't think that problem applies to excluded claims. Um, I can see Alex's, Alex's point, but I kind of like the idea of having a way to say, you can use anything you want except that. And I'm not sure that the way that, uh, Alex is modeling things will allow that. Yeah, I think, I think I agree that there is some value actually in being able to do that, even though it's not future proof, like I said, and I, and I'm kind of wary of the, the implication that. Like you can't have proprietary things, for example, or just non-standard things that you choose to add to the job. That's yeah, I was not necessarily say, forced though, right? Because yeah. like there, there's nothing stopping you going and getting a certificate with your extra proprietary claims permitted in it. Granted, uh, it might be a it does prevent that, but is there any mechanism that we can use that says like? Um, you can use whatever you want as long as it's not IANA defined or something like that. Um, you know, like the, the special ones that ha that have special uses. But you know, if you have something outside of that set, you know, go go for it. Should we put some rule like that? Well, so keep in mind that we we define the passport to allow unknown claims and be ignored yeah. as long as yes. you don't have a uh, passport type. So putting another constraint on top of that that takes away that ability seems like an issue. Right. 
And, and that could be that could be the bar too, Ben. Just precisely what you suggested that if it has a PPT, then all of the inclusion rules apply to it. And if it doesn't, then it's just kind of uh, fair game. A, a potential uh, rule. Yeah, that, that's true. If the PPT is there, then you know the claims that uh, does that work? I can. You don't it. necessarily know which claims are covered by the PPT. You I mean, we still want to have shaken passports that have, you know, ran, ran RCD in them, for example, right? But like that aren't necessarily RCD passports. But the, yeah, my, my point was more if it has a PPT. In other words, if we if we separate claims into two buckets, one that is special super claims we're concerned about, and the other is like, you know, not so much. Then in that the bar between those two could be, does it have a PPT? I mean, if you do, let's say we created may include, which is the list of claims that you may include, but we treat that as if you include something outside of that list, the VS should not interpret that as you had authority over it. But that doesn't mean it can't trust the passport. It just needs to be aware of that value. So for example, let's say, you know, just here's a thing that I think would be useful passports had a JTI parameter to uniquely identify them. You could include that. That doesn't need to be trusted by the other end. It's just for, you know, trace back kind of whatever you want to use it for. That may include, may not specify that. And that just means the VS shouldn't take that as authoritative information. Doesn't mean that they should just outright reject the passport because it has a claim that wasn't in the may include list. So you get that, so that compatibility. That's really interesting, but it's such a different semantic that we originally started talking about that I would be hesitant to stick that sort of thing in at working group last call. That's like a new, that's like a completely new idea. I mean, it really, it really would be us creating two tiers of claims, right? And however we divide them up. And that's, that, I agree, that is a much broader question than like the, 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 the scope of this particular document. <laughs> Okay, the direction I think I've gotten is remove excluded values uh, and continue with the must include, must exclude and permitted values. I still think at least there's value in having a must exclude, even if it's not a universal value. Like I, I think I think there we could get some mileage out of that. Yeah, agreed. Agreed. Okay, I, I know what to do then. Uh, for a moment there, I didn't, but I think that's where we landed. Okay. Awesome. I, I think we're on to the next document that's in working group last call. John. John, what, what am I doing? <laughs> Sorry. Or is it Chris? This passport RCD, we've got do we have yeah, anything that we I need think to Chris. grind on? Chris, yeah, I'm sorry. Yeah, so yeah. I think I can just give an update. Um, we, in the, the last meeting, we did discuss uh, the major changes to the integrity. Um, I haven't gotten a lot. We, we, we had good discussion, I think, on that call, but uh, I haven't gotten any real further feedback on it. So, um, you know, I don't know if we want to wait for any more feedback or if we want to proceed with that document. Uh, any comments that anybody has in this form? Um, sorry, I haven't really been looking at the list for the last three weeks. Has the did the issuer um, issue uh, get resolved about the fact that it was very unclear what? how the issuer would be marked confusing myself um this was like when we mean do we mean do we say subject we mean organization do we mean that, that stuff yes yeah. didn't did i think we did david Hancock, you what did what did we do on that <laughs> i think we did resolve this I'm not sure what issue we're talking about, actually. Yeah. So this is how the IS field, um, like what oh, the right. value of the IS field is. And we kind of had some, it should be like, you know, reflecting the subject. We had some things saying it was the organization. I, at least recall for ADIS purposes, set 
crooked okay. one way. Do you remember which way this was set crooked? Yeah. <laughs> okay. Now I remember. Yeah. And I and in fact, I don't remember it that we actually, actually came, came to a conclusion. We just said it. we need to figure that out. Okay. That's always the best. I, I thought we got this crooked. Um, I mean, I think I think we were leaning towards it just being O, right? Organization. Yeah, I don't remember. Does anybody have any strong feelings about this subject? I'm trying to remember. I'm trying to look to see if I wrote something specific. Uh, one thing I will say, there are definitely certificates out there without an O, which might get a bit problematic. Um, Sorry, I haven't been as caught up on this. The, the O, are you saying the ish, uh, ISS claim in the uh, RCD passport would have to match the um, organization attribute in the subject DN of the certificate that signed it? Yeah. One, one problem with that that I was dealing with in the ADIS, kind of looking at one of those documents, um, at least the way it's currently defined, a, a potential problem is that there can be non-unique organization names. Like I know there are many service providers that have the same name uh, across different states. So does that, you know, if you mandate it that it has to be the O, the way the some of the ADIS documents say kind of the O would be duplicated potentially across different organizations? So, yeah, but I mean, the, the good news about ADIS is, of course, that it has this whole like certificate issuing structure and guidance around that, right? And so, I mean, there, there are all kinds of things that could be done to ensure the uniqueness of O in a, a constrained context like that. Now, out in the open world beyond the STIGA scope, this is an entirely different issue. But I think for ADIS, that should, that, that should be doable, right? Like you would just have some different way you would designate entities that are different that ordinarily would have the same things in their O's. These would be this would be a change to any of the certs that those entities were already being issued by SDICAs in the ADIS context, I, I presume. Well, um, it would be good to understand because I think that was sort of a question generally. Um, the subject names are they. There, there, there isn't a general mechanism to guarantee uniqueness. There is there. Maybe no, they're kind of yeah, outside of Addis. There kind of can't be, um, because the within you know with the subject, not issuer. If you if you combine both subject and issuer, then it's not a problem. But you have multiple CAs, so they they can't really necessarily do anything to ensure that there's uniqueness across the CAs. The advantage with Addis has though is that there's this OCN that if you include the OCN, then you know, you have a reasonable sense that, you know, there's not duplicates, although technically, uh, I guess a service writer could get a cert from two different CAs. Exactly. Right. But, but, the, but that is still the same entity. If you include the OCN, it's, I mean, it's still the same issuer um, entity. The problem is just that the organization, does that necessarily include the OCN? That gets funny when you have you know, one organization that has multiple OCNs. So you, that's why we didn't put that in the organization. In Addis, the organization right. is just the well, company name. Yeah, yeah, I think that, was, that that's exactly what we banked on um, for for guaranteeing uniqueness. That within the context of the certificate with a specific SPC, there should be hopefully that the entity representing that SPC is maintaining uniqueness among subject names. Well, and, and moreover, like the passport itself is signed by a cert. Right, and this is just saying that whatever that cert is. So I mean, the cert's always unique and is always traceable in any number of ways. The this this point is just about if we're going to have this, and we could have a whole discussion about why we want to have this. But like, if we're going to have this, just having it have some reference integrity with the base certificate on some point seems to be the requirement. And like having it be O, like you know, even if O's aren't unique, the certs that those O's are drawn from are still unique. And are still traceable and are still, you know, you can have separate authorization policies with regards to them. So it seems safe to me, even if they weren't. But would anyone like to talk me out of that? So I was under the impression, and maybe I'm wrong because other people know the ADIS stuff better than I do, that the ADIS definition of the O in a uh, certificate was just kind of informational to make it easier for troubleshooting and stuff and people looking at it to understand. I, it surprised me they would ever try to match against it. Well, we said though, Ben, that it needs to be, a, you know, a known organization, right? That it's used in the, you know, in other places, right? It's not just some random text string. And, and and yes, but but have we said it's always 
if we said it's always capitalized the same, always spaced the same, and all always, that sort of thing? No, 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 but it needs to be recognizable. Well, even the existing databases don't have that stuff consistent, right? So, so we're, we're just, doing, we're we're doing just as good as it is done right now, right? And all we want in the is value is to have something like that. That's the point. We want to have something that says the, the entity issued this is canonically known as this. We don't want people to just be able to arbitrarily set that. So there has to be some process, right? Like the CA process and at us that, you know, at least it doesn't let Newstar claim that it's at t right. And, you know, as long as that exists and there's like a human readable field in the S that indicates who this entity broadly is, I think it's probably okay. I, I think it's okay. Uh, just commenting, you know, if you know, maybe a potential solution is having ish be the subject DN in its entirety in a string form. Um, that would have that at least the other way that is. Yeah, that um, was the other alternative we considered. And yeah. so, I mean, and uh, honestly, I, I don't think there's there's a ton of practical difference. I mean, it, it, like I said, I think the intention was just that there be something human readable in the passport that indicates roughly who the organization is. And like, you know, doing the whole subject DN might be overkill for that. But like, if people think there's some material distinction, certainly uh, we we can look at that. Are we expecting the verifier to verify? I mean, not maybe a little, <laughs> really, <laughs> like in the sense of I think, like I said, it's it's useful. It's certainly useful that Newstar not try to be able to pass itself off as AT and T, right? Um, so, I mean, I want something that's human readable that has some forensics around it that indicates, yeah, like this, this is the entity it's supposed to be. And yeah, it'd be good if you check that against the O field and the actual cert. Doesn't yeah, the, the important part is that it's representing that the information came from a third party, not the, uh, so, and, and, you know, will you want to represent that to the user somehow? Maybe will you want to have reputation over those third parties? Maybe. Um, but I think that's part of the whole framework that people have to figure out going forward. Wait, and so yeah, the reputation, there's a great one. If you're going to do reputation, I would say you, you kind of need subject DN because I'm looking at the authorized service butter list in, in, you know, in Addis for the STIGA and there are three companies, with the same name. But, but um, if you're doing reputation, you would do it from the cert. That's the point. This is just like a human readable hint that we're embedding into the passport. Like you, 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 reputation should be based on who right. actually signed it, and that should be based on the cert itself. And so, again, I, I look at look at this as just an indication that it is a third party source. Here's copying from the cert some human readable thing that suggests what that third party source is. But obviously, your actual trust is based on the cert, not on who you may think you know based on reading the text during that person is. So, just to make sure we're all on the same page, the current document says. Uh, and it's must level. The value of the ISS, however, must reflect the subject name field of the certificate used to sign a third party passport. So um, I think we don't say organization. In fact, I think we changed that to be more generic. So if we want to go back to that, we can, but. Uh, um, I, I, I think it matters much, was my point, right? <laughs> like it just matters we fix it one way it, or the other. It was very unclear to me when I read it that the verifier should not be machine checking that ISS. It seemed like the that that claim needed to be checked in order to know whether or not to trust the RCD. I think I agree that, that that's not true. You should just be checking the certificate, but it hadn't quite occurred to me while I was reading it. So as the uh, shepherd for this document, I'm a little bit confused about what change people want. And and I warn you that uh, LDAP went down this path of taking a subject name and converting it to a text form and back and forth. And they're not always one-to-one -one and onto. So I think we're much safer if we're able to pick a portion of the name that must be used here. I think, I think so long to, to John's point, so long as it's clear that it's not used, you know, the, the ISS claim is not used you know, by a machine. It's purely for a human. It doesn't really matter. Uh, as, as long as people don't interpret the document as, oh, I'm going to use that for my, you know, uh, reputation analytics. No, that's a bad idea. Um, then, I, yeah, I agree. I don't think it matters. Should I clarify that in the document? I, th yeah, I certainly wouldn't hurt. I haven't, I, to be I honest, read the document in full to, to answer that question 
I certainly agree with that approach. Uh, if everybody agrees with that, I can clar I can try to clarify that. Okay, with five minutes left, I think we um, have uh, a way forward on this one. Chris, are there other issues from working group last call that need discussed? Not specifically, unless uh, folks have any further comments, but um, so uh, as far as I'm concerned, uh, I got the initial feedback I was looking for. Um, so um, we can extend it a little more or we can continue working groups last call either way. Well, I'm, my gut is it, um, we're gonna need a rev that will do at least a, another, um, Abbreviated last call on depending on what the rev looks like. Okay. Yeah, and I'll fix that uh, that specific issue. Um, but otherwise, I don't have any other specific changes. So I've got a question for um, the people on the call. Um, given the conversations that we've had about what the state of implementation really is, and that there has been um, uh, peer to peer interrupt testing that has been showing up issues that are, are coming back to us to address. Would people attend if we put together something that looked like a SIP it that focused on STIR um, uh, functionality? I would be strongly for that because, uh, again, it's from Inchbound just to, based on, again, my experience, I'm just starting to see a lot more issues when, then, uh, versus what I've expected at this stage of implementation, and they a lot of them seem to be silly. So, um, David, um, Jack, John, any Chris, anybody else with you know big implementations, would it be something that um, you would you would attend and find useful? Sorry, I don't really know what you're talking about. Um, so he's talking about doing a Zipnox style implementation testing, they, they kind of kind of a test bed style thing, right? Where we would all bring some implementations like a bake off and just make sure they work together. Not fundamentally against that. No, that sounds like a good idea. Uh, Transnexus will attend. All right. So I'm sure New Star could could come. Um, you know, given that we're still in the remote environment, um, I, I suspect that we would be talking about a, a virtual event, which makes it a little bit more difficult. Um, if there's somebody that feels um, really strongly about making this go, get a hold of me out of band, and we'll start trying to work out logistics about how, how we would make something like that work. Okay. Is that um, something that could be facilitated through the ADIS testbed? It can be, as long as it's basically open to non ADIS participant, or there is some like simple. I think actually the. Oh, that's going to be the problem. That's going to be the problem, right? It is. That's that's why I was kind of hesitating on this as well. I mean, yeah. So like the ADIS test bed is specific to shaken, right? And like if the ITF is doing this, I don't really feel like we should be measuring shaking compliance. And that that that's the the hard edge on this, but like. I mean, in principle, there's nothing, I think, precluding us getting together and just making sure our implementations work together. It just would not be, we're going to make this compliant with like this out of spec. <laughs> so the last time we did a SIP it, uh, related to STIR, it was um, up at the University of New Hampshire and um, it was hosted by the SIP forum. Right. We should talk to the SIP forum, right? I was going to say that yeah. I, I was going to ask you, Robert, if uh, anybody reached out because uh, we were literally talking about that two weeks ago. Uh, I, I I felt it in the ether and started poking. I think, I think SIP forum would be fine trying to pull together literally a SIP it that is going to have a focus on 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 stir. Yeah, yeah. yeah this definitely could be awkward for us because, like, for example, we we don't have. A SIP, something that talks it. We just have something that talks the ATIS HTTP API. There might, there might be ways to accommodate that. I think some vendors 
have those. It, again, at, at the very least, we can put something which is uh, based on one of the open source products, like uh, something like, again, Camille open SIPs will, uh, will talk the HTTP API and use your headers. That should be fairly <clears throat> straightforward. Yeah. Yeah. I just posted a, a, a link. Uh, there is an open CP uh, in, in, interop, which is doing also a stir and shaken, which is right now, uh, these last two days or something like, like this. Uh, so it would be interesting to, to see what uh, results they, they got from this uh, interop event. But I, I agree that would be a great idea to have an interop because uh, I, I, as more people are developing uh, are implementing this, I think more issue will be discovered. Well, one of the things that I see, and I'm, again, I'm not sure how to address that, like the issues that I see are from like big SBC vendors, like Ribbon, and I'm not sure they participate in the IETF directly, at least I haven't seen anybody from them, and just there should be a way to get uh, figure out a way to get them involved. <laughs> Well, we can promote that in IP and NI and other forums where I know they do participate. So hopefully we can get them to participate. Because again, they're, they're being uh, like, again, if there is a way to show that they're, or if they, uh, they're willing to basically test the interoperability and standard compliance, that will help a lot. Okay. I think we've run over a minute. Uh, thank you all for your active participation. I think we got some good issues put behind us. And uh, the next thing, if we'd have had more time to talk about, was the messaging doc that we adopted. Um, John, I think we're waiting for you to post the working group version. That's true. It shall be done. And I also owe you the charter fix for connected identity. Okay. All right. Thank you all. Thanks. Bye. Thank you. Thank you.